our studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, California. This is a CUBE Conversation. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in our Palo Alto studios having a CUBE conversation, but for a little bit something different, instead of having our guest here locally in Palo Alto, we've got him all the way across the country, across the pond, all the way over to Holland, and he's in uh, Utrecht, and we're happy to welcome Eric Klein. He is the infrastructure architect for Friesland Campina. Eric, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, so before we get started, a little background on Friesland Campina for people that aren't familiar with the company. Uh, Fries Campina is a cooperative uh, company owned by farmers, uh, predominantly in the Netherlands, Belgium and Germany. It's a uh, international company. Uh, we have about uh, 34 countries with, we have uh, either sales offices or plants in there. Um, we are one of the biggest uh, dairy companies in the world uh, and love to be there. It's yeah. a very good company to work for. It's amazing, I was doing a little research. I mean, the scale is amazing. You guys are, you operate in a hundred countries, uh, export tea, you've got offices in 34 countries. I think it said 23,000 plus employees. It's quite a big operation. Yep. So a big operation doing about 10 billion liters of uh, kilograms of milk a year. Great. So it's a dairy, we're here talking about digital transformation. It's always fascinating to me, kind of the reach of digital transformation in everybody's company. Everyone says everyone's really a software company, you know, kind of built around a different product or service. So what were some of the challenges that you were looking towards in 2018, 2019, in terms of digital transformation in this mature industry of, of dairy? Uh, the challenges that we having is uh, that you have to make sure uh, that everything is safe. Uh, the, the products are safe, but also the data is safe. But also that uh, we have a lot of things move to the cloud. And also that the performance of those applications move to the cloud is to the end user satisfaction as well. So you're not looking only at, at, at transferring data safely from the cloud into our offices, into our production environments, also protecting our production environments for everything that's going bad on the internet, uh, but also having to make sure that the applications are performing uh, to the liking of the uh, the end user, so to speak, to our customer and our consumers. And was the objective to build new applications in the cloud, or was was it more kind of lift and shift some of your older applications in the cloud? Because those are it's, it's two very different challenges. Our, yeah, it's a lift and shift of our older applications. Uh, for example, we're now in the middle of moving our uh, SAP environment uh, to uh, to the cloud. At least the development test and user acceptance environments are moved to the cloud. Uh, the other ones remain still within a traditional data center environment. And we have moved all our of our Office 365. So that's uh, Skype for Business, uh, SharePoint, uh, but all the other applications to the cloud as well. <laughs> and there we have in the whole digital, uh, uh, digital transformation, uh, the, the challenges that really comes back to the end user. Those are huge applications, SAP and Office 365. Those are not insignificant um, yep. applications at all. So what were some of the challenges? I'm sure we have a lot of, of, your, uh, of your peers watching this. What are some of the tips and tricks that you can share with them? Big challenges that you had to overcome, things you thought about, maybe some things that you didn't think about in that, in that transformation. Uh, if you look at the SAP landscape, it's the sheer amount of interfaces between the different components of SAP. Uh, that was something that, that uh, made us decide not to move SAP to the cloud, not the production environment and the acceptance environment. Uh, that was a too big of an impact that would take too long to do and we don't have that time. If you're looking at Office 365, uh, the fact that uh, Microsoft is very averse in having anything in the middle. Uh, that brought us some some real challenges, and and we did that already uh, in 2004, 2015, and and we had our uh, fair share of all fun and games. <laughs> so what was different about it then, than today? I mean, obviously the cloud has moved quite a, quite a bit. Um, I don't know if you can mention uh, the, the which cloud you put that, it that, in. Yeah, correct. The fact that Cscaler now. Uh, does the updating on all the changes within the Microsoft environment. So you don't have to do it yourself. 
you don't have to constantly monitor the uh, the RSS feeds from Microsoft. Do all the changes yourself. Now it's all done by by Zscaler. All the uh, SSL bypass, the authentication bypass, has been set correctly. So when that came on board, uh, that made our life a lot easier. Wow. Uh, the first part of the migration that we did in in Europe, uh, especially in in the bigger locations like Amersfoort, which has our headquarters. Uh, we really had our challenges to keep the, the end user satisfied. So, um, just a, again, kind of the scale of the end users, you mentioned that a couple of times. Is this in support of all the 23,000 people that are employed uh, at Friesland Campina? Uh, is it a subset yeah. or is it remote workers? How are you kind of allocating this effort? It, it, it is in, indeed all users, except for the factory workers. We don't allow people that work in production to direct access to the internet. So those people are not as much excluded, but they have special PCs where they work on. So you're looking currently at about 15,000 people that are working with Office 365 directly on a day-to-day -day basis within Freezer Company. Wow. So the other thing you've talked about repeatedly is not only satisfaction with the users who are interfacing with the systems, but security. So what were some of the security yep. considerations that you considered? How did you kind of bake security into your process? And as we hear all the time as we go to different shows, including security shows, you know, it's not a bolt on anymore. You have to be thinking security throughout the whole pipeline of the process. So how did you think about it? How did you attack it? How did you solve some of those problems? We, we start thinking about it already in 2012. Uh, we had at that time within Fritz Compina a, uh, a program speci specifically driven out of the OT environment, so the operational technology, so the production IT, so to speak. And they come up with, a, with an architecture based on the ISA 9599 norm. And we took that on board as IT and uh, continue to work on that. So from 2014, we already had on our plans, the architecture to separate the various layer of the ISA 9599 uh, framework into security zones. And we're constantly building on that one. We're refining it, we're improving it. Another question on security, really in kind of the network architecture, did you have to re redo anything within your, your network architecture and, and to make this move to the cloud possible? How did you, uh, how did uh, you address the network? It was a complete redesign. It was a complete redesign. Uh, in the uh, previous to that, we just had IT and we had one or two firewalls on site that connects to a certain part of OT, and that was it. And now we have an architecture where we can integrate all different flavors of OT. Uh, there's no need for OT to have their own internet connections for maintenance, uh, for support, etc. cetera. Uh, but it's all integrated and secure. Uh, we made, and the, the reason for that is that uh, you can't, uh, in this day and age, uh, have a, uh, an island structure. Everything needs to be integrated, everything needs to talk to each other, et cetera. So Eric, this, this uh, interview is sponsored by Zscaler, you're, you're a customer of theirs. I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit about how you know, their offering enabled you to do stuff that maybe you couldn't do before. How did you get involved with them? How are they working uh, with them throughout this project? And how has that really been an enabler for your, cloud, you know, your move to the cloud? The, in in 2000. 13, 2014, it was a request from the business, a very strong drive from the business to have local internet breakouts, specifically to get local uh, localized contact, uh, driven out of the, um, uh, how do you say that, uh, marketing departments. And then we looked at, okay, how can we enable that without uh, creating firewalls on every location we're having, uh, making it very expensive, etc. And at that time, our uh, provider, Verizon, came up let's do a cloud security with Verizon, with a Zscaler uh, and uh, do a proof of concept and build on that one. Uh, so that worked, uh, that, that gave more granularity, gave the people in the countries that, that needed localized con uh, content, got the localized content, uh, speedy up the application for those specific countries. So no hairpinning from uh, Tokyo, Japan, back to Singapore, back to websites in Japan. Uh, so that, that helps a lot. But like I said, it was early days, so we had our challenges in getting that working, getting it secure, getting the traffic uh, corrected to the correct uh, Zscaler node, and so on. So we did make, uh, from the initial setup of this network, a number of iterations 
uh, to come to where we are today. So Great. it's not a, a, a one uh, decision and then it works. No, it is a decision, see what it works, which challenge you're getting, uh, and then take it to the next level. Right. If we do the same thing with T-Scaler as they're offering today, it will be a lot quicker. We will have a number of those challenges that we had at that time, we will not have today. So as you look forward, what's kind of next? As you mentioned, this isn't a one-stop shop. This is this is an ongoing process. What are kind of your next priorities uh, you know, over the next six months or so as you guys continue on this journey? To another data center, so not to the cloud, but to a different data center. Uh, so that's a big, really a big program. Uh, the other thing we're uh, we are looking at is um, how can we improve uh, remote access, uh, preferred access management as, as part. Uh, we're also looking at the, 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 the CPA product of Zscaler. We're doing a uh, proof of concept uh, probably in the second half of this year. Uh, so, uh, but on the other, other side, um, this year, 2019 for Future Company is, is a, uh, how do you say that in proper English? Uh, stop and look back and see what's really important, what we need to go forward. So it's not going crazy on all different kind of projects. It is, okay, what will actually contribute to the profitability uh, of Fritz Campina going forward. I think that's a really great close. I know it's, it's late in uh, Utrecht. I appreciate you taking some time out of your evening. And I was going to ask you the last question, you know, what advice would you have for your, for your peers, for other practitioners that are look, looking at this and you know, either in the process or planning out their journey. But I think you hit on a big one right there, which is really focus on the things that matter, focus on the things that really make a difference and just don't start doing science experiments all over the place because you can or it's fun or it's interesting. Well, what, what, what my worries are for the future and what, 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 what not keeps me awake at night, but that, that's uh, too much to say, is um, the, 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 the bad that going around in this world uh, is getting uh, stronger. Uh, they have more resources than we as a company has to defend of us against. And the, the good challenge would be is uh, identifying what is your traffic that is good flowing in your network. Because if you're knowing what is good, everything that's not defined as being good can be immediately defined as being bad. And in that case, you will uh, have a better position in preventing yourself against everything that's going wrong. Like uh, WannaCry. Uh, if you know that uh, WannaCry is, is using a, a well-known port used all over the place within Fries and Compina. Uh, but it, it, if you then see that same port being used to communicate between servers that never communicated before, or to workstations to servers that never communicated before, then you can say, okay, stop that one immediately because that's not good. Right. And in the moment, our biggest challenge is identifying what is the traffic that's good within our network. Well, that's a great tip, you know, that's great. You know what the positives are and if it doesn't make the, uh, the green list, then shut her down and find out what's going on. Correct. All right. Correct. Well, Aaron and the reason why, why we, we uh, identified WannaCry is that somebody for some reason identified, hey, this server never talked to that device, why? Yeah, and we're here because, because of, with IoT, yeah, you have to do that, right? You get all, because everything's IP connected, right? Whether it's the shades and the HVAC system, all the way down to all your manufacturing processes, distribution processes, Correct. IT systems. Correct. Correct. Our big advantage was that the call back to the uh, command and control service was already blocked by Zscaler, so it didn't hurt us that much. Yeah. Well, good. We got to keep the cow safe, keep the milk safe, and the uh, yeah, absolutely. Would you say the ten billion gallons of milk that you guys kick out a year, or something like yep. that? It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. All right, Eric. Well, thanks for sharing your story. Uh, good luck on your future transformations, and uh, and good luck next week. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you very much. All right. All right. All right. He's yes. Eric. I'm Jeff. You're watching the Cube. We're in our Palo Alto studios and Utrecht, Holland. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.